accounts payable best practices are even more critical now with the advances in technology and the explosion of new frauds. It's becoming easier and easier to exploit minor weaknesses in the accounting and accounts payable process that might have gone undetected in the past. That's why we're going to do a quick review of some general accounts payable best practices, best practices that managers sometimes turn a blind eye to when it's just for a short period of time and it would make their lives much easier not to have to make whatever the change in question is. We'll focus in on those moments and what can go wrong. So as tempting as it might be to ignore any of these, especially the last two, which are frequently overlooked. So as tempting as it might be, don't ignore any of these, especially the last two, which are frequently overlooked. As we get started, let me say that my goal is to spend no more than one minute on each of these best practices, despite having a lot more to say. Most listeners would not have the patience to listen to me yammer on and on as much as I'd like. So if you want more information on any one of these issues, please do a search on this channel because we've done individual videos on some of them or and or get my 127 best practices for accounts payable book which you can get from any online booksellers. And with that, let's dive right into our accounts payable best practices. So accounts payable best practice number one, create an appropriate separation of duties across all functions in the accounts payable and the procure to pay space. Now, this is getting more and more difficult to do as accounts payable departments become smaller and smaller thanks to the advances in technology. But it is still just as important for as, as it ever was. For without appropriate separation of duties, um, less collusion is needed if an internal fraud were to be perpetrated. So as hard as it is, we've got to keep, keep our mind on it, so to speak. Best practice number two, internal control should be across the board, no matter how loyal the employee is. At the end of the day, when they look at the fraud statistics, and this has been true for forever, well, not forever, but you know, going back in, in, in time, as long as we've been looking at fraud statistics, most internal fraud is committed by a long-term trusted employee. And while 99 and three quarters percent of all employees are honorable, you don't know who is the one bad apple. So don't make any exceptions, regardless of if you think, oh, Joe's been here forever, he would never do anything, or Jane's been with us 25 years, she's loyal, don't do anything. Internal controls across the board. Um, accounts payable best practice number three, eliminate all or as much of petty cash as you possibly can. Now, I know that about 25% of all companies still have a petty cash box, and there's just so many opportunities for things to go wrong in the petty cash box. Um, plus, it is an extremely inefficient way to handle reimbursing people for uh, various items, especially with small dollar items, which is all that should be going through petty cash. So as much as possible, um, get rid of the petty cash box. I can tell you from personal experience, I've had responsibility for the petty cash box at two different different organizations and inevitably we'd always end up with it out of balance. There was always less money in it than there should have been, not a lot, a few dollars, and we'd waste so much time trying to get it into, um, get, get it in balance, not to mention handling all the reimbursement requests. So if you can get rid of it, get rid of it. And in this day and age with, you know, credit cards and everything that we can do electronically, there's less and less need for it. Accounts payable best practice number four. If you have a petty cash box, and as I said about 25% of you still do. Never, ever, ever reimburse somebody for a payment of an invoice. First of all, your employees should not be paying invoices themselves. And if you reimburse them in this manner, then there is no way to identify duplicate payments um, if, if it happens. So you, if that invoice shows up in accounts payable, it's going to be paid. If for some reason, it, you know, the employees made the payment and you have to pay it, um, in this case, so you want to make a big to-do about it, if you do, and tell them, like, never do it again, we won't pay you, we won't reimburse you if you do, but then you need to make sure somebody goes back, does the three-way match, and extinguishes the purchase order and the receiving document. Just make it clear to your employee do not pay invoices. Invoices are meant to go through the accounts payable space. Okay, accounts payable best practice number five. Do not allow employees to put invoice, pay for the invoices, as I've already said, and then 
put in for reimbursement on the expense reports. Everything that I said about reimbursing through the petty cash box um, is the same for reimbursing on an expense report. You'll never find a duplicate payment, and if that invoice shows up, it will absolutely be paid. Now, accounts payable best practice number six, do not reimburse something out of the petty cash box that should be put on an invoice or an expense report. Okay, this is the petty cash box is not a shortcut, not there to make life easier for, for everybody. It's for small uh, out of pocket expenses. So um, I like to, as I said, uh, to get rid of a petty cash box, but I understand that in reality, many of you can't. And now I know you're gonna not gonna be upset, but I'm gonna stop talking about petty cash boxes. Okay, next I'm gonna focus on corporate credit cards, be they an expense card, uh, a P card, even a fuel card. Each card should be for one employee and they should not share it. Once you have two employees using the same credit card, um, you've lost your um, audit trail and moving forward, you will not know who made a transaction with 100% uh, clarity. Even if someone's only supposed to use that card for one transaction, if you give them the number and the expiration date and the you know three or four digit CDS code, uh, then they have that information forever. So either have the person who owns the card, who is responsible for the card, uh, make the payment um, or get the other person their own credit card, but no sharing. Also, you negate some of your protections with the bank if you allow folks to share the credit card. Best practice number eight, along the same lines of sharing credit cards, they should not share passwords. Sometimes this is really tempting to do when an employee is going on vacation, an employee who's the only person who does something, let's say master vendor file, and it's really tempting to have them just give their password to someone else and let that person do it while they're on, on vacation or out, whatever, but it's uh, it, it negates your appropriate sep separation of duties, and what you need to do is set that second person up with their own password to do it. Yes, it's a little bit of extra work, but it's the control that you need and uh, your auditors are going to demand. Policy and procedures manual. First of all, every accounts payable department should have one and accounts payable number nine says not only should you have one, but it should be updated regularly. If it's not updated regularly and it doesn't reflect the work that's going on in your accounts payable department, it's useless. So if you have it, you put all this time and effort into it, you have it and it's perfect and then you don't keep it updated, well, then you may as well not have it because you don't know what's accurate in there and what's not accurate. And so you're, you'll, you know, you may as well not have it, but really you should have it. Okay. Um, accounts payable best practice number 10. If you are mailing payments, and of course we're talking about uh, uh, checks here, they should be mailed whenever you make a check payment. They should not be returned to the person who requested the payment. Returning the check to them is a breakdown of your internal controls. And there have been more frauds than any of us would like to admit um, that have been perpetrated because the check was returned to the person who requested the payment instead of being mailed directly. So mail all uh, checks. Uh, this is just one more reason. It's a smaller reason, but it is just one more reason why you want to move to electronic payments. But it's not the real reason. There are many other benefits, which I'm not going to talk about right now. I'm not going to go off on a chantage. Okay. Accounts payable best practice number 11. You should be getting a double W-9 from every single supplier that you do business with when you first begin the relationship. Now, some of them will come back and say, oh, we don't have to give you a W-9, They are we're exempt. Um, that's nice that they think they are exempt. You need to get that W-9 and you need to come to that conclusion yourself. Because if the IRS comes in and audits you uh, for a, an information uh, return audit and it turns out they weren't exempt, um, you saying, well, they told me they were exempt is going to bear no weight with the IRS. You are expected to make that determination yourself to do the analysis and um, you should. So you've got to get that W-9 from everyone in order to do it. And again, you just have to get it once when you first start doing the business. Okay, along the same lines, accounts payable best practice number 12 says as soon as you get that W-9, you should use IRS TIN matching to uh, verify that it's accurate. And you want to do this at two times. You want to do it when you first get that W-9 because if there's something wrong, then you want to go back to, you have to go back to the supplier and get that information corrected and at year end. Now you'll be saying, well, why do we have to do it at year end if we did it when we first got that W-9? And the answer to that is simple, is that sometimes
sometimes your supplies will have a change in circumstance which they forget to tell you about and then you issue that your 1099s using the information that was on that old w9 and you end up with a b notice and then you have to fix it so much easier just before you issue your 1099s run all that information through irs to match it one more time and catch it and then when you catch it yourself you can fix it without having to go through the rigorous steps that the irs requires uh, accounts payable best practice number 13 along the same lines you want to get a new w9 from any of your suppliers anytime there is a change on their account so while that w9 is good forever if there's a change in circumstance as we talked about well then you don't have the accurate information so when they change bank accounts when they move when they have a change of address you want to get a new w9 because a lot of times what that, that change is because there was a change in circumstance it was a merger there was an acquisition or maybe they changed their legal setup they went from being a, a corporation to an llc who knows what they did but you just want to get it so that you can verify it okay and of course obviously if there's a merger or acquisition and there's a change in name then you really want to get it because there could be a very definite change okay with that I want to just take a moment and I want to say um, before we go to our last few best practices if you're getting any value from this talk I'd love it if you would hit the like or the thumbs up button it sends a message that you're getting value from this talk and we should make more like it and a personal thanks from me to everybody who has um, hit that like button or the subscribe button for that matter so thank you okay moving right along accounts payable best practice number 14. you want to move as many of your small dollar purchases as you can away from invoices and move them to p cards with of course the appropriate internal controls in place um, and the reason for this is you want to get these small dollar invoices out of your accounts payable department you have a limited staff and you want that staff to spend their time focusing on your larger invoices um, but again you only can do this if you have the appropriate internal controls in place uh, because if you don't you can end up uh, double paying and that that's not a good thing um, accounts payable best practice number 15 you want to require everyone who has anything to do with your money and this includes everybody who works in your accounts payable department to take five consecutive days off uh, during which time somebody else does their job you don't want them to take the time off be at home and then work from home doing the job and the theory behind this is that if you do this they will then um, if there's an ongoing fraud they will not be able to continue keep the fraud going and the fraud will unravel in this time period it's also good from an HR standpoint but uh, you want to make this part of your policies and procedures and I know that not many companies do uh, something like I don't know 10 or 20 percent do but it's really it is an important from a control standpoint and, and again HR as well okay accounts payable best practice number 16 I've been haranguing about this for a long time and I know that most companies don't do it and in fact in the United States only about 10 percent of all companies do it but it's really simple to do and it's your best protection or one of your best protections against fraud and that is to use a separate computer for all your online banking activity and to use that separate computer for nothing else and the theory here is is that if there is some sort of a takeover maybe they got malicious software uh, malware onto a computer then they won't get the information about your online banking and they won't be able to hack into it uh, what you can do is when you're getting new computers hold on to one of the older computers and then have IT come down and do you know all their magic stuff you know where they run all their programs and they put um, very high security on it and then just use it for your online banking I know it's a pain um, we do this here and when you have to stop what you're doing to log on to the new a different computer wait for it to boot up the whole bit it's a pain it's much easier to do it on your regular computer the one that you're working on but and this is a big but it will protect you from one of these hacks and these hacks can be deadly when they happen they don't happen often but when they do there can be a lot of money involved a lot of money out the door so it's something to think about and accounts payable number 17 if at all possible and I realize that in many cases this is this is impossible but this few possibly can you want to limit the way you pay each of your suppliers to one particular payment vehicle so 
uh, one particular supplier always gets paid with checks or they always get paid with cards or they always get paid with ACH. The problem occurs when sometimes you pay with a card and sometimes you pay with a check or an ACH and then um, it's much easier to make a duplicate payment. And in fact, when companies first started using P cards, this was uh, one of the biggest sources of duplicate auditors were finding the payment auditors who are, who are coming in. So if possible, limit it to one payment vehicle. I realize that uh, sometimes like you might have a dollar limit and you won't put anything over $5,000 on a card or anything over $1,000 and you usually buy $500 stuff so it's fine like if you're buying from, from office supplies and then you have a $2,000 purchase and it can't go on the card. So I, I recognize that sometimes it is impossible, it is, it is not possible, but if it's possible, uh, then you're really urged to do that. Now, you may have noticed that this talk was labeled part one, and that's because there will be additional parts. You should check back for this channel um, to see what they are, and we'll link it to this one when we have we have part two and part three, which probably won't be for a few weeks, so check back. But it's not that we don't think invoices are important. Nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, we did a short video on best practices related to the three-way match, which many of you probably know as the best practice way to process invoices. And you can watch that right now using the link that has appeared on your YouTube screen and is in the description. Good luck.